Um, thank you, Mario, for sharing this information with us. And we will go ahead and get started since I know we started a few minutes late. Um, and I apologize for the technical difficulties this morning. So, Mario, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you when you're ready. All right, give me one quick second. Can you guys see my screen? I can. Okay. Yes. Super. All right. So thank you uh, for uh, joining us today. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Mario Moreno. Uh, I have been in uh, cybersecurity, or not in cybersecurity, but in IT since 1999. Um, let me do one thing. Sorry. I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quick and move it to a different screen because I have it on this other screen and my camera is over here. So sorry about that. Super. All right. Can you guys see that again? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Okay. All right. So uh, I've been in IT since 1999. I've had the benefit of serving uh, in a variety of different roles in that time. So I've been an account manager. I've been manager of sales engineering. I've been technical services director, uh, sales manager, and currently uh, I'm BCIO for high touch technologies. Uh, today, what I'm really hoping to be able to do is to just give you a little bit better understanding of cybersecurity. Uh, and the risks that are out there for the small to medium business, and then tell you about a uh, multi-layered cybersecurity framework uh, that we have uh, that can help combat those cybersecurity threats. So the first part of that is, you know, really kind of getting a better understanding of what cybersecurity is, right? Every organization's, uh, every organization uses computer systems. Um, they store data and process data. Maybe 10 years ago, all of that data was on systems owned by and physically inside the organization. Uh, but now uh, organizations, data and systems are everywhere. They're in the cloud, uh, they're in internet applications, they're on people's own uh, computers and mobile devices, and uh, even with many third-party service providers. So all of those systems are connected to the internet and here's where you know, cybersecurity uh, comes into play, right? Uh, it's because it's on uh, in the internet that you know malicious actors such as criminals, competitors, uh, even sometimes other countries, uh, they want to harm organizations or try to get money from those organizations. Um, they typically cause harm in three different ways. Um, first, uh, by gaining unauthorized access to an organization's confidential information, by um, making information unavailable to organizations and sometimes by tampering with an organization's information. So um, cybersecurity is the term used to describe how an organization tries to prevent this harm from happening. Um, so basically cybersecurity is about protecting internet connected organizations from malicious actors and accidents. Cybersecurity is important because the landscape for cybersecurity is uh, continuously changing. Uh, it's evolving insanely fast uh, at a really fast pace. And the actors are, are more sophisticated nowadays than they have been in the past. Uh, frankly, they've, you know, cyber crime has become, you know, really big business. Um, every organization, regardless of its size, has risk. Um, we're seeing an increase in compliance and regula regulation requirements in order to combat these threats. Um, we've also uh, seen an increased focus on the requirements for what to do after an incident has occurred. 
Um, in turn, cybersecurity insurance uh, requirements and payout guidelines, they just become a lot more stringent uh, to be able to qualify for. So what we believe is sec security is, is, was, and will always be high priority for companies because you know even a minor breach can have disastrous consequences. Um, things like a security breach can either take down your entire network resulting in a loss of revenue or steal your confidential internal uh, company strategy documents, or even worse, it could compromise your customer's personal information like credit card details, uh, or even still source code of software that you're trying to build. So, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, everybody understands that it isn't just for, you know, large companies, that large companies, private companies, highly regulated companies, they're not the only ones at risk. Um, any company of any size could be a target of a cyber attack at any time. And in fact, um, what we're seeing are, you know, the smaller businesses are often easier targets. Um, with fewer layers of security for hackers to navigate, um, that seems to be kind of what they say the low-hanging fruit for those uh, for the bad actors. And if you really think about it, all the digital information stored or accessible via your company's desktop, laptop, laptop servers, networks, mobile devices, um, you know that has passwords, files, birthdays, social security numbers, um, trade secrets confidential documents, essential files, client information, financial information. Um, there's just a lot of information out there that, um, you know, there's a responsibility to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to protect that data, not only for you, but for your customers as well. Um, there are three basic parts to a breach. Um, one of the good ways to think about it, I found this example and I thought it was really cool. Um, you know, if you think about it this way, imagine your house, um, you know, ideally you would close all your doors and windows at night, but let's say one night you forget to close the window, uh, you leave it open and let's continue to imagine uh, that that night that we have a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> um, that open window is the vulnerability. Uh, the zombie would be the threat. Uh, and when that threat finds the vulnerability, um, and it can exploit, uh, the, you know, the security breach happens. So, you know, to further kind of, oops, sorry about that. So to further, uh, you know, define those, you know, the threats, they do come in all shapes and sizes. A threat can be an insider threat. Uh, maybe it's a disgruntled employee that wants to take advantage of the organization that he or she felt treated them poorly. Uh, the threat could be also from somebody that's uh, completely unaware of what they're doing and they just don't know the rules and the policies and procedures that are required to protect the data. Uh, we could have an attack coming from uh, the inside, you know, from the outside of our network. Uh, we could have threats of a construction company that could be doing work in front of our data center or business uh, that could accidentally cut the fiber optics to that facility. Uh, the important thing is, you know, it could be a person, it could be an event, it could be malicious, it could be accidental, or it could just be based out of ignorance. Um, you know, you just never really know. Um, we can use the example of the house again. You know, we know that our house has all kinds of vulnerabilities when it comes to security, uh, but windows are pretty fragile components of our home. And in fact, they're so fragile that, you know, I can throw a rock at a window and break that window pretty easily. And once I do that, I have access to the home. Now there are a lot of ways to get inside a home and a window is just one example. Um, but and but I, my intent here really is just to illustrate that, you know, the windows, the glass windows specifically in your home are vulnerable and they are vulnerable to rocks being thrown at them. And the same thing applies essentially uh, to our businesses, right? We all have those vulnerabilities. Now, just because we have a vulnerability in our system doesn't necessarily mean we're at risk. Um, you know, maybe a system that's just not that important, maybe no one cares about, about it, or maybe there's just not a vested interest in exploiting it. Um, however, exploit itself is taking advantage of a vulnerability. So um, in the case of our home and the windows, uh, the windows have a vulnerability. The exploit would be throwing the rock at it. And um, 
Once we've done that, we've exploited the vulnerability of our window by breaking it with a rock. Hopefully that gives you a little bit, you know, clear understanding, because I know these terms get thrown out a lot, uh, you know, threats, vulnerability, exploits, and wanted to just be able to give you kind of another way to look at it and, uh, and hopefully give you a bit, little bit better understanding of, of what, what we're combating. Hey, Mario, what's a, what's a good example of just in your, in your opinion, like a, a cyber window that's, that's easy for um the, for the bad actors to to break into that that house for a business what's like one example of something that a common window that gets left open yeah one of the one of the more common ones uh i would say is security patching and updates so i mean even you you think about users how often have you been uh, working on something uh on your laptop or device and you get a little pop-up that says hey we want to do an update on your system and you have the ability to just you know push the button and say I'm going to delay that till later. I'm going to delay that till later. Um, same with uh, the 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 back end system. So the different servers and applications that you have um, in your environment, um, if those aren't oh, patched Probably not. on a regular basis, um, those uh, can be very easy uh, for the bad actors to find those uh, those vulnerabilities within the system to gain access. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when it comes to security, again, every organization, they'll do some level of technical and procedural things to defend itself. Um, some of these can be buying software, it could be buying uh, special services, um, it could be, you know, buying hardware or training, adding new business processes. And what these are all known as is they're known as controls. Um, you know, the, a lot of the hard work of cybersecurity is figuring out what are the right controls. Um, and then making sure that those controls are actually working to do the job that you intend them to do. And, and if an organization has the, enough of the right controls um, to mitigate those vulnerabilities in the system, most attackers, they'll fail. And, uh, and those that do succeed will be identified quickly before harm can be done. So there are three main types of controls. Uh, the first one is a preventative control. Um, for example, one of the most important uh, simple controls is a password, right? It prevents an unauthorized user from pretending to be an authorized user. You know, much like having a password, uh, prevent, preventative controls are designed to stop bad things from happening. Uh, some examples of preventative controls are, you know, trying to uh, give everyone a unique username and password. So in some organizations, I know to save on money, uh, they have a, um, you know, a single password, a generic password and, and, and um, username that everybody uses. Well, that means that's multiple people that have that information. That means that that's also probably an easier um, place for a bad actor to compromise. So if you can have everybody have their own unique password and username, uh, that's gonna be one step in um, you know, helping you to be in securing the assets that they have control of. Another one would be uh, locking a user's account if the wrong password's entered. So if, they, if, a, if a wrong password's entered a certain number of times, locking that account so that an administrator would have to unlock that to make sure that that's the person who is should be trying to get into that is the right person versus maybe a bad actor trying to figure out what that password is. And, and like we talked about before, you know, keeping the software up to date is a is a huge um, is a huge effort. And then training users to be more careful to make sure you know that they're when they're clicking on links or emails. Uh, there's detective controls which are used to detect detect when something's happening. Examples of detective uh, controls are uh, antivirus and anti-malware applications. Uh, there are systems that look at network activity to detect you know, malicious behavior. Um, they analyze log files and, uh, and they try to make sure that they uh, capture those malicious uh, content before it gets to the system. And then the final one is really corrective controls. Uh, they're often used um, after an attack to put things right. Examples of those are uh, you know, incident response teams, uh, forensic analysis, and even restoring uh, data from your backups. 
whatever the terms uh, that people use, what's important to remember is that controls are simply uh, technical and procedural things that an organization does um, or things that an organization buys to control vulnerabilities um, to, to be able to reduce their cybersecurity risk. Uh, this we we have this in here really just to illustrate you know the the objective of of a layered security approach um, to give you at least a visual to understand you know every layer of that security is intended to block as much as it can um, obviously you know uh, some things will still get through and then it's you know as you get deeper every layer is should catch um, those bad actors or the bad activity that's trying to happen. Um, because the you know the real hard choice uh, for organizations is selecting the, the controls that it needs. Um, you know the controls need to be based on the risks that organization's information uh, has. Um, control frameworks are a pre-selected collection of controls that either help an organization to pick the right control or that provide a mandatory set of controls that an organization can follow. Uh, control frameworks are like a box of chocolates. Oops. Um, instead of um, having to pick from large range of different controls, um, which they need to match the organization risk, they just adopt a pre-selected uh, controls, you know, for something that's tailored to their organization size and activity. Um, you know, some of the some of the 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 control frameworks that are out there. Um, are, I'm sure you probably heard of them, is HIPAA, the uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, you know, that contains uh, statutory requirements for securing healthcare data. There's uh, PCI, so the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, uh, mandated control framework for all organizations that store and process and transmit uh, password card data. Uh, there is the Center for Internet Security, which is an industry-wide uh, collaborative framework detailing you know, 20 critical controls for cybersecurity. And really what, what our intention by our seven layer cybersecurity model that we're showing, it's really a, a control framework uh, that we have put together um, to help organizations get more secure. And this is, you know, these are the, the, the layers uh, that we have found to be successful in helping to aid security. And we'll go through in a little bit more detail on uh, what each each of the individual of these are and kind of why they're important. <clears throat> so when you're looking at your frontline defense, uh, the main objective of this is just to minimize the number of threats our users have an opportunity to interact with, right? Uh, the more I can block before it even gets to a user, uh, the more, the better uh, an organization is and the more secure and the, the, the less responsibility uh, we have to, uh, to make the right choices when we're all very busy uh, you know, trying to do our jobs. So the first is a, uh, is a firewall. You know, a firewall is the, basically it's the front door of your corporate network. Uh, this will screen all the content passing through it and it can either allow or block or filter the content uh, passing through uh, to make sure that nothing harmful reaches the other side. Again, this is usually one of the first uh, lines of defense. Again, uh, lines of defense, it, it is that, that gateway between the internet and inside your business. Uh, next is email security. Uh, email is actually how 80% of all cybersecurity attacks start. I mean, you just think of all of the emails that you get. Um, they're you know, riddled with uh, all kinds of bad things unless you're doing things to filter them. Uh, unless you have things in place to be able to quarantine uh, those, those uh, emails that are suspicious. And then if you have sandboxes uh, to be able to help ensure that they're uh, not going to be uh, exploited in your environment. We talked about this a little bit already, um, but, you know, patching is another uh, strategy. You know, when, when a vulnerability is found in a software, the, the manufacturer will work out how to fix that vulnerability. They'll provide an, uh, an updated version of that software. And the process of updating the software to fix vulnerabilities is called patching. And uh, once a patch is applied, the attacker can't exploit it anymore. Uh, unfortunately, this is a cat and mouse game with the attackers. 
because once a vulnerability is discovered, you know, the attackers, they'll try to use it before we've had a time to, you know, any time to patch it. So patching quickly is super important um, in order to, to be able to do that consistently, to be able to beat those attackers, you need to have a good patch policy and a good plan. Uh, Endpoint in uh, protection, DNS filtering. Again, this is um, geared to, to aid, to prevent, or to help assist in cautioning people when they're going to uh, malicious sites, to be able to filter those sites out, to have them either, you know, second, you know, think twice before going to sites that uh, either have been known to or uh, have potential uh, to be uh, locations where a lot of bad things are on. Not necessarily uh, content that you don't want, but locations, it can be, but, you know, locations that where uh, a lot of the bad actors have, you know, bad files or a lot of the uh, threats can come from. And then the fifth one uh, in this category is a, is a SIM. This is a security information and event uh, management system. Uh, really what this is, it's a, it's a, a way to, uh, in real time, to identify, monitor, uh, record, and analyze um, all of the, this, this information that's coming from all of these different security layers. Uh, it correlates all of that information in real time and then decides, hey, is this a, a threat activity or is this a non, is this, are these just, you know, different events that may or may not be um, point to uh, an actual threat happening. And this is done through a combination of uh, artificial intelligence systems, and in some cases can be eyes on screen, meaning we have people watching as these threats are coming in or as this data is coming in and really um, deciding, hey, what do we need to do uh, to be able to mitigate that threat? And then the next uh, level is kind of what we call the midline defense, and that's really uh, protect your people in the process. Again, this is this is what what I would say is you know how do I give my users the tools that they need? Um, so once you know once the first I guess the first part of that is if I'm a user and I'm needing to connect into my company's information, um, how do I do that securely? And what, the best way to do that. Uh, when you're trying to get onto your uh, network is through a VPN connection, right? A VPN uh, creates a secure tunnel from either your house or wherever you are to the company network. Uh, then it allows you to access your corporate resources as if you were virtually within your company's private network. So again, it's the most secure way uh, when you're not in the office to be able to access information that's inside your office uh, that, you, that you need to get to and do that securely. Uh, and then multi-factor uh, authentication. Um, this is anything that's requiring more than a password it is called the multi-factor authentication. So a very common uh, implementation um, of MFA, which is commonly referred to as, um, is uh, as the user access their smartphone to provide a one-time code to be entered in addition to the user's password. So this is being offered uh, more and more often now uh, for more and more things. And uh, our recommendation is anytime uh, MFA is offered, uh, I would take it because it's, again, the most secure way, at least that we have at this time, uh, to maybe make sure that your uh, that particular system isn't compromised. And this one is huge. Um, you know, almost 90% of all cyber attacks are caused by human error or behavior. So the more we can educate our users, uh, the better. Um, user education is, is great in that um, it gives, it brings attention to something that for some users uh, is, is you know, secondary or even further down the list of what they're thinking as they're uh, working and operating within, the, you know, within your business. Um, I'll give you one easy example. I, I was uh, where I fell prey to this. I was lucky that it was one of our actual training uh, simulation attacks 
is, but I got an email from work from, I think it was Amazon, saying that my package was being delayed and, and it had a link for me to click to see when that was coming. Well, it just so happened that I was expecting an important package. So I clicked the link and then as soon as I clicked it, I was like, oh man, I know I just did something wrong. For one, my, my home uh, Amazon stuff would never come to my work email. I'd go to my personal email and I was it came through on my work email. So I knew right away. Uh, I was fortunate in that I got a call in that particular time. I got a call directly from my, my technical, my, my security team. And they said, hey, Mario. And I was like, I already know what I did. I'm sorry. Um, and they said, all right, no problem. So again, what that does though, is the next time I got an email, I paused, right? And that's really what we're trying to do is not only to educate um, like what we're trying to do here today, but um, educate your users to know what to look at, to know what sort of social engineering um, uh, tactics people use to try to get you know, your, your uh, critical information, uh, to know, um, you know not to click on emails, um, that come through you, like for an example would be if you, uh, LinkedIn is real big right now uh, for a corporate environment, you get a, a request for somebody to join you on LinkedIn. Um, you would think, okay, that's no problem. I'm going to hit that link and I'm going to go, I'm going to see who this person is and I'll see if I want them to join my network. Best practice would tell you, don't click the link, open up LinkedIn and then go find the, the, the message that way. That's the most safest way. Same would apply with um, um, what I just thought forgot the uh, the social any social media um, out there is don't click any of the links that are there. Go to their websites directly and find the information that you need. So just to, like in a quick, but educating users to that and then sending simulation attacks. Again, what that does is that just makes me more on point as a user to second guess, you know, just answering or just clicking on an email. Um, and so that's where this end user training does a really good job. Again, 90% of cyber attacks are caused uh, by some sort of a human error or some, you know, behavior. Uh, doesn't have to be malicious. Again, it could be uh, purely accidental, but the more you can bring it to the forefront of their mind, uh, the better and more secure you will be as an organization. <clears throat> and the uh, the last line of defense, um, you know, the last line of defense, I really, you know, I think of, um, you know, if you've ever taken a self-defense class, you know, specifically a knife defense class, uh, the first thing you're taught uh, is to understand that you're going to get cut, right? They tell you you're at a disadvantage, when somebody has a knife, you don't, and you have no way, no way to avoid the situation. Just get it in your mind that you're going to get cut. Well, security uh, nowadays is pretty much, you know, along those same lines. Uh, you just need to realize that you're going to get breached. There's going to be an event. And, you know, much like knife defense, how bad or how fatal the situation turns out to be depends on your training and how prepared you are. Um, and that's what, you know, that's really what this 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 last line of defense is, you know, it starts with just making sure that you have, you know, antivirus. Um, it's, you know, it's responsible for detecting, removing, um, reporting on malicious code, uh, intercepts and inspects application-based traffic and content, uh, just to make sure that there aren't any malicious threats hidden within that application or content. Um, Again, the goal of there is to, to catch that before it, it damages things. Uh, the more, the bigger one, and I would say probably the more important one is uh, the endpoint detection and response. Uh, they, I found a, uh, a data point that said that the average time to identify and contain a data breach is 280 days. So that's 280 days that something malicious can be in your environment capturing information, whether it's passwords, data. In some cases, they may even be waiting there uh, for you to connect to one of your partners, which may actually be their actual target. Um, you just never know. But the longer it sits there, the more compromise you have, the more data they're getting. Um, so you know, the objective here is 
How quickly can I identify a threat that's gotten by your defenses? How quickly uh, can you contain and quarantine it? And then how quickly can you remediate and get back to normal operations? So that in, is endpoint detection and response. So for your laptops, desktops, uh, and servers, um, this again uses you know, artificial intelligence um, and algorithms to be able to identify very quickly when a breach has occurred, then it quarantines it, then it helps to uh, remediate, and it helps you work on your way of getting back to normal operations. Um, again, think knife defense. It's not a matter of, hey, am I doing all these things so that I don't get compromised? It's a matter of it's going to happen. So you, we need to be able to be prepared to be able to know that it's happened right away and do something about it as quickly as possible. And that's what EDR does. And then the last one is, you know, uh, data backup and disaster recovery. Again, um, you know, we need to make sure that we have a plan. Uh, backups are, are gonna be of critical importance um, you know, one, if you if you've ever had a uh, um, or if you've heard of the uh, ransomware where a bad actor will get into your environment and they'll encrypt uh, all of your files uh, and then they'll encrypt your files and they'll make you pay a ransom to in order to get the key to, to decrypt those files. Well, if you have a good backup and it's not compromised, well, then you can just recover from that backup and be back on your way and not have to pay that ransom. Um, they've gotten pretty sophisticated and pretty tricky. In some cases, that malware, uh, that ransomware will come in, they'll delete your backups, and then they'll encrypt uh, your data. And they're, they're constantly evolving, like we talked about before, they're constantly evolving uh, to be you know, more malicious and to get around the security protocols and the controls uh, that we put in place uh, to be able to mitigate them. So when you're talking backups, you know, important. Uh, it's important that you're that you uh, try to follow the three to one backup rule. So that's having three copies of your data, uh, two of those on different media, and one copy being offsite. So uh, I guess a little breakdown of that is if I have my actual data, which is running on a server, I need to be able to back that up onto a different device that isn't that server, potentially another server. Uh, and then I need to be able to take that data and actually have it somewhere that's off-site, uh, potentially in the cloud or potentially another location. Um, that's That would be three copies of the data. That would be on two different types of media, and then one of those would be off-site. Uh, that's best practice, and that'll uh, at least do go a long way of ensuring that any encryption or any bad actor that gets in your environment won't be able to get all of those copies of the data and you'll always have that data to be able to recover from. It's also important to remember uh, that it's um, your responsibility to protect your data and that only doesn't that only that doesn't only apply to the data that's on your premise. Um, even you know services like o Microsoft 365 or Azure, uh, they recommend that you um, implement a data protection strategy for the data on their platforms. Uh, these, uh, they're, they're not typically included uh, with their uh, standard monthly fees. And then, you know, it used to be a day where, you know, whenever you talked about DR, or disaster recovery, um, it was really meant uh, to be able to um, combat, you know, if there was a natural disaster, if there was an earthquake, if there was a flood, if there was a tornado, or a local disaster like a fire or a hardware failure. Or people disasters, you know, uh, you had to be down for maintenance or um, or an accidental deletion of information. But more commonly, having a disaster recovery plan is is really uh, helping to combat security disasters. So uh, been and seen many environments that had gotten so bad that they had to uh, recover, uh, go to their DR plan if they had it, or totally rebuild their entire. Uh, infrastructure because they didn't have the right uh, controls in place to be able to identify that fast enough to minimize the impact to their network. A few things um, is regarding um, does a DR um, that you'll want to take into consider. You just need to know which systems are the most critical, know what system workloads are the most important to maintain uh, business continuity. 
uh, know how much data and time you can afford to lose. So understanding what your uh, RPOs and RTOs are, so your recovery point objectives and your recovery time objectives. Um, recovery point is how old is the data? So if, uh, if I back up or, or move that data you know, uh, daily, that means that my data is always gonna be 24 hours old. If I need that to be shorter, then I need to be able to send that information uh, within a shorter window. Um, and then recovery time objective is how quickly do I wanna be at, back up and doing normal operations? Is that 48 hours? Is that 24 hours? Is that four hours? Uh, whatever that time is, those knowing the RPOs and RTOs will help whoever is helping you with your disaster recovery figure out what's the most optimal uh, way to uh, design that disaster recovery for you. And you also need to know, you know how you will access that data and from where you're going to access it. So those are just a few real quick uh, things from a disaster, both backup and disaster recovery uh, that, you know, that you'll need to consider um, when you're implementing either one of those solutions. <clears throat> and, you know, unfortunately, there isn't a magic number as far as, you know, you know when you're talking about our layers, uh, the security, you know, landscape is, is again, um, has a, is fraught with, you know, new threats, wider impact. Um, the, you know, cyber crime is big business. And so, you know, it, there's a there's an increased focus on those uh, requirements uh, to secure environment and um, you know as I said before every organization they have to do some level of technical and procedural things to defend itself uh, the, the 11 layers uh, that I talked about um, are again a form of controls and they're really uh, important concept in cybersecurity because a lot of the hard work like we mentioned before is selecting the right controls um, and then again, our goal is to have enough of these controls in place uh, that they'll mitigate uh, all of those vulnerabilities that we have and to you know, cause those attackers to fail. And um, hopefully we can catch them when they do get through as quickly as possible. And that's the goal. But important thing to note you know, is that each organization is on their own journey of security. So you know, know that even though we've been talking about what we believe to be best practices in security, um, not all organizations are in the same spot to implement, implement all of those um, protections. So a good place to start um, is really um, to identify, you know, what, what are your compliancy needs? Um, are there specific uh, business requirements? Um, you know, these can be legal and compliance requirements. They can be security requirements. They can be industry uh, requirements. And, you know, they're, you know, business specific requirements and or they can be even cybersecurity insurance requirements. You know, think along the lines of, you know, what what's the size of my business? What industry am I in? Am I in? How much hardware? What kind of hardware do I have? What software do I have? Um, what are my employees knowledge? Um, what's the organizational type such as, you know, am I fully remote? Am I hybrid? Am I all on premise? You know, what are my long term business goals? These are all, you know, some of the factors uh, that will help guide you on figuring out, hey, you know, what are the things that I am required to and what are the things that I need to based on my business, uh, figure out how to be able to control uh, and protect. <clears throat> then you need to just choose um, the required or appropriate framework that will include you know, proper controls to satisfy those requirements. You know, remember security has become uh, an important and rapid evolving, rapidly evolving uh, challenge for every business. And because of this, you know, like, we, like I mentioned before, there's you know, compliancy requirements out there. There's frameworks uh, to help organizations understand what the minimum you know, responsibilities could be regarding their security posture. Uh, but you just have to figure out you know, what is that framework that you wanna use and then once you find a framework that you want to use, then you need to benchmark, benchmark where you're at to that framework. Uh, and then once you've benchmarked where you're at, uh, then the next thing is to, you know, is to be able to set a, a target, target security posture based on that framework to manage from where you are today to get you to where you want to be. Oops. And then I wanted to, you know, give you a little bit 
um, more information, you know, some things that, you know, again, it's not all about what the business can do. Um, everybody has a personal responsibility of things that they can do to help um, with regards to security. <clears throat> the first one is, you know, treat all uh, email with a degree of, of caution. Remember, uh, email is how 80% of cyber attacks start. Um, so the Think Cute, which I didn't mention before, but you know, Think Cute is a is a checklist, and um, you know the 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 C stands for um, you know if you get an email, it, is that email making you curious? So does that email make you curious to click on something? Um, is it uh, unexpected? So is that email unexpected? The um, T is, is there a time sensitivity element to that email? Will something happen or will you miss out on something if you don't respond straight away? And then the E is for emotional, uh, emotional, oops, sorry, emotional trigger. You know, are you frightened of losing something? You know, is it, are you going to lose, you know, access to an account or are you going to be worried about something? So, Remember, cued is, it, does an email make you curious? Um, is it unexpected? Is there a time sensitivity of an action they're trying to get you to do? And does it, is there an emotional trigger? If, if those elements, you know, if you can think of those elements in, in any email uh, matches any of those, uh, you're very, it'd be a good point for you to be very cautious with that email and uh, think twice before clicking on it. Uh, the next one, and really just, and it goes in line with what we were just talking about is, um, you know, it's great to be able to not click on those emails or the link uh, to be able to identify when they're there, but it's even better and more important for you to be able to report that uh, issue to your security team. Now, sometimes there's a button that you can press to report that email, um, or maybe there's an email address that you have to forward it to. Uh, or you have to call somebody. Uh, the, the biggest thing here is make sure that you find out from your organization uh, what is the best way that they want you to do uh, to be able to report that. Um, so again, the best thing is see something, say something. Uh, the other one is, you know, super important. Um, you know, there's a reason why companies restrict or should restrict the software that you can install on your computer. And uh, that's because installing software is one thing that attackers like to get people to do so that they can break into their computers, right? A lot of, you know, depending on where you uh, download, sometimes, as a matter of fact, even in uh, legitimate sites, there are known uh, instances where bad actors were able to put malicious content into an illeg legitimate application, uh, you know, that, that, we, that people were using. Eventually, they found it, and, and, and the company remediated it. But you know, it it it's it's not it's very common for attackers uh, to be able to do that by getting you to do you know by by just loading that malicious content within that software. So you know, before just going and loading software, it would be a great idea again to check with your organization your organizational security uh, team or partner. Uh, to be able to just understand, hey, is this okay that I that I load this? And then, you know, as far as your physical environment, you know, most attacks do happen over the internet, but it's really important just to be aware of your physical environment. You know, take care of your devices. Don't let other people read your screens. And if you lose a device, you know, report it, you know, as quickly as you can. And, you know, and be aware if you see, you know, social engineering is insanely popular. Um, it could be physically, uh, I've even seen it physically on site uh, where people are trying to gain access to a building uh, or locations where they're not supposed to be. And uh, that gives them, you know, they basically get inside uh, the environment and be able to plug in and do things. So uh, just be aware of that. And again, just like with everything, just report it uh, whenever you can. And then one of the, you know, another real important thing is, you know, following best uh, password, best practices and using MFA wherever possible. You know, unfortunately, <laughs> until we're uh, figure out how to get rid of passwords, I know we have a lot of different sites 
um, that we have to keep passwords for, and that makes it very difficult. Um, but um, you know, some of the things that you can do to make your passwords more secure is use a unique password for every site. So again, I know that's challenging, but best practice is you don't use the same password twice. Um, and then use longer passwords. So uh, use phrases, uh, use special characters. Um, in some cases, you know, like I said, they talk about using, you know, sentences. Um, you know, you just using those two will make things uh, more secure. And if you, the best thing to do would be to use a password manager. Uh, that's what I use um, because again, it gets challenging to remember all of those different passwords. A password manager can not only help you remember the passwords, in some cases they can come up with uh, secure passwords uh, that can help you there as well. And um, if any service uh, or website you use offers you two-factor authentication, please take it. <laughs> uh, again, it's gonna go a long way uh, I know it's one extra step that you have to do to log in, but it's well worth uh, the time for you to uh, help yourself uh, be more secure. And then finally, remember, um, passwords are like toothbrushes. Uh, you don't share them with other people and you don't uh, share them uh, between sites. And then there's you know six key uh, cyber security controls. Um, you know I'll go quickly through these. You know just applying update updates like we talked about, getting those patches, getting those uh, those things done. Um, you know making sure that that's done on a timely manner uh, is again it's it's a great it's a great step. It doesn't take much to do that other than having making sure that you have a good plan and a process to be able to do that. Uh, do some application whitelisting. Um, that's where you make sure that the, uh, the configuration, the computer uh, is configured to only run software that the organization explicitly permits. So that's what application whitelisting is. Only those things that the organization wants on those systems are on those systems. Uh, the next is hardening. Um, you know, that's where you just, you know, you, you, there's two parts to that. First, you make sure that all configurable settings on the operating system um, are configured for security. And then secondly, you remove any unnecessary resources of vulnerability, uh, deinstalling, you know, applications that'll never be used, et cetera. Uh, and then one of the easiest, I guess I should say, if you're doing some of these other steps, it makes it easy uh, to be able to do is to um, limit the number of people within your organization who have administrative access to systems. So the attacker's aim is to, uh, to be able to access systems as one of those administrators or privileged users because you know, when that attacker then he can get access to any of the data or make the systems do whatever they want. So if you can reduce the number of accounts that have uh, that administrator access, then there's fewer accounts uh, for that attacker uh, to be able to get to or to really want to get to. And then, you know, like we talked about, uh, multi-factor authentication, you know, I, I think I've said multiple times what it is, but, you know, anytime you can get an MFA, uh, please take advantage of uh, having MFA in your environment or require it in your environment um, if you're the decision maker. Um, it, just, it just makes it that much easier to be able to uh, control your environment. And then the last one, again, is backups, which we talked about. Uh, making sure that you have a safe backup, make sure that you're leveraging the 321 uh, process for backups is going to go a long way to be able to protect. And if you want to take that next step of making sure that you have a disaster recovery plan, uh, that'll again further uh, protect you to make sure that you'll be able to get to normal operations in the event of an, any sort of disaster, uh, but in this context, specifically a security disaster. I hope you found uh, this information educational. Uh, I'm, I'm open to any questions if anybody has any. You mentioned a password manager. Um, is there a app or a software specifically that you would recommend or one of those that you would recommend as far as, you know, choosing or selecting or how does that, has one find or, or utilize a password manager? 
Yeah, so um, so what a password, so I use, per, personally, I use a last pass, L-A-S-T-P-A-S-S is a personal password manager that I use. Um, and I do use that for um, both my personal and professional. And what that does is one, you, you obviously you have, you have your password to get into your password manager, uh, but then that password manager, you uh, input you know, any websites that you go to, you input um, any data that you wanna protect and you put your passwords in there. Again, it gives you uh, the opportunity to, uh, to be able to, for them to create a password for you, or it gives you the opportunity to put whatever password you want and to be able to secure it. Um, that way, and you can usually use those in two different ways. Um, you can just have it so that if there's a, a place where I'm getting into and I need to remember what that password is, I pull it up on my password manager and then I input it into that website. A lot of them like LastPass, uh, we'll have, if you have that application on the device that you're using, a lot of times you don't even have to remember the password. You just log into LastPass and you can click the password and it'll feed the password uh, to that application uh, without you actually having to type it in. So there are a bunch of them out there. Um, we don't necessarily uh, recommend any particular one, uh, but it would just say, just kind of use, you know, whether you're using it for personal or whether you're wanting to do something organizational, um, look at those and find out, you know, what are what which of those are going to meet the requirements of what you're looking to do, and keep you as a business owner uh, to have the right level of control. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And make sure you're off mute if you have a question. <clears throat> The websites that let you save your password, is that safe or is it best not to do that? Yeah, I, I personally, I do not pass. I do not save that um, because I don't um, I don't have control of that security. Right. I don't know how stringent their security is. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that I know, like the reason I put it on my password manager is because I know I have a solid you know, password. I change that password every so often. I don't use a single word. I use all, again, all of those, you know, the password guidelines that, that we spoke about. Um, I leverage those. I don't, that password, I definitely don't reuse anywhere else. Um, and the, another good thing with, with regards to the passwords is don't recycle them. So one of the things, one of the issues that does happen is even if you have an old password, you say, say I had an old password that was, uh, say two years ago and think, okay, well, it's okay for me to reuse this password now. I'm using it on a different context, not even the same site. I'm gonna reuse it, right? Because there are only so much clever ways that we can come up with passwords. Um, what happens is, is those old passwords, oftentimes they'll find those on the dark web and they will cycle those through and try those later uh, on a regular basis, especially if they know they're tied to you. So. That's another reason why it's not good. So anytime you do a dark web scan, sometimes you can find some of your old passwords that are out there. And that, again, that's another important reason why you won't want to do that. But for me personally, um, I don't, for any of those sites, I don't typically save those, again, because I'm not familiar with what they're doing to secure and protect those. So I usually lean towards um, using systems that I'm aware of what the security protocol is. And um, you were, when talking about backing up your systems, most places now are, like I think most of our systems that we use here are cloud-based. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that we have other backups besides just the cloud? Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's good good point. So there's there's two things. So. Will you let's start with if 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 my application or the information that I have is already in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So if it's already in the cloud, then the thought there is is it okay to have one, I should have it off-site, I should have it somewhere else. Um, meaning if my data is in the cloud, I want it's okay to back it up to a different cloud. Oh, okay. Right? It's in two places. Mm -hmm. Now technically it doesn't follow three, two, one, because I only have it, I have my original data. And then I have my cloud backup, so it's in two. Okay. But it's it is the it does get offsite, and I do have two different copies of it. And okay. for the cloud, that's 
probably as good as we're going to get as far as going. It's not quite as necessary to have that other copy. When you have your data on prem, it's always good to, again, to have that extra copy local for several reasons. One, if I ever have to recover a, a large number of or lar large amount of data, it's going to be much easier for me to be able to do that locally versus having to recover something that's in the cloud. So what that that original, that other copy on a different media inside your organization is intended to be, give you fast access to as much you know information that's within that window time frame that you have that data to be able to do that quickly without having to again pull that across the internet or have something shipped to you in order to get you uh, operational or backup as quickly as possible. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just if anyone has questions. I was just thinking we probably need to download a whole bunch of reports in case something happens to our CRM. <laughs> <laughs> and if anyone has uh, either on this call or um, for those that view this video later have questions um, is the best way um, obviously, there's a ton of information to process, and especially with your tips as far as, um, you know, with small companies being potentially more at risk because they don't have some of those um, high budget security um, line items in their budget for security systems or defense systems. Um, so they may be that low hanging fruit or choosing how fast you need these security checks to cycle through. Is it 24 hours? Is it two hours? Is it um, all of those are kind of what I would imagine be important in terms of choosing kind of a a security and IT plan. Um, so if people have questions, um, uh, what's the best way to reach out as far as uh, high touch? Um, yeah, so high touch, um, you can reach out um, either via email. You know, you could go to our website, which is uh, hightouchinc.com. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't put it on here, uh, but that's high touch inc. So it's uh, H I G H T O U C H inc.com uh, and there's several different ways you can you can access uh, from there um, where you can put in what you're looking for and then that'll get distributed to the appropriate people within the organization that'll give you a good look at um, you know the, the the different services and solutions that we have uh, in place and you can find something that really fits uh, your need as a business uh, you're always welcome to give me a call um, you can give me a call at uh, area code 913-660-1418. Again, that's 913-660-1418. And again, my name is Mario Moreno. Mario, thank you so much for uh, for being and taking the time to run through that with us this morning. Happy to help and uh, look forward to answering any other questions that may come up and, and good luck on your security journey. Thank you.